So I'm going to start on behalf of everybody with a, with a thank you to the foundation for organizing this event and keeping us all motivated. Uh, my name is Ben Braun. I'm a, a UCSF. I'm a pediatric oncologist. I treat JMML patients, but I spend most of my time in the lab trying to um, come up with something better. Um, so to introduce today's session, I w was asked to introduce a session on the basic science of JMML. And basically what I thought I wanted to do was put it in, into context and talk about some of the history. But I want to start with one of my favorite cartoons from a very obscure computer science book. Um, and I think a lot of us feel this way when we're confronted with complex uh, systems such as cancer cells. Uh, and they're really hard. And they're intrinsically hard to study. Uh, we don't really have all the proper tools to fully comprehend or manipulate the complexity going on within even a single cell. Um, and we're going to hear, hopefully, from some experts in uh, signal transduction biology today to help clarify some things. But unfortunately, I think some of us may leave the room feeling only a little bit more secure um, because, in fact, the difficulties are um, not intractable but real. And uh, even the leading experts right now still have a ways to go before we really understand these systems well. So to set the stage, I just wanted to go back a little bit, and um, I'm sure there are plenty of people in the room who know this better than I do, and so please let me know later when I miss something, and uh, please don't be offended if I don't include your work. I um, could only pick a few uh, highlights of the last few decades of JMML research, but I did want to point out that um, this is one landmark paper from uh, 1953 from Dr. Cook who at least recognized this in a case series as a clinical entity. And it's interesting to note that even in the small series, uh, the thrombocytopenia and hemorrhage and the risk of transformation to acute leukemia were all noted even in a small cohort. And these are uh, really some of the principal features of JMML. Um, and I th put this in the basic science introduction because I think this is where science has to get started, is we have to at least recognize this as a, as a clinical and um, pathologic entity in order to further understand the basis for a disease. Um, that took a major step forward when the association between the JMML clinical syndrome and neurofibromatosis was identified, um, and this is probably the, one of the most important articles that was able to do that. And again, in a small case series in 1978, um, we have this uh, predilection for um, a CML, a chronic leukemia, which um, we would now recognize as JMML uh, in this setting, all these circles, which is an unusually high frequency for this disease. Um, and so this was the first hook into understanding scientifically what this disease was going to mean because now we had a genetic syndrome that was associated with this disease and a pathway into the genetics. And frankly, in my opinion, over the next uh, few, several decades, the genetics of JMML has been the strongest component of the research, and that's really where most of the advances have been made. Um, so skip forward now from 1978 to 1990 when um, really the biochemistry starts to become uh, evident. At that point, uh, there had been major advances in molecular biology and biochemistry, and the NF1 gene had been cloned and then identified as a regulator of RAS. The major importance of this finding isn't just to help get us into the field of signal transduction in JMML, but also to bring JMML and neurofibromatosis onto the center stage of cancer biology, because RAS, from its uh, discovery as the first human oncogene in the early 80s, was and, and remains a very important and very popular gene. And so I think a lot of the interest in the science of JMML can now be fueled from this point onward in the basic um, interest in studying cancer as a general phenomenon. Um, from this point forward, um, the NF1 was understood to be a tumor suppressor gene, as shown quite clear, clearly here in this paper from the Shannon Lab um, in the mid-90s, showing here that a a uh, patient with neurofibromatosis is heterozygous at the NF1 locus, but when they develop JMML, the normal allele of NF1 is lost in all the leukemia specimens. Um, and so this identified NF1 as a classic tumor suppressor, and therefore loss of its inhibitory activity could be responsible for the neoplasm in JMML. Uh, and this further implicated uh, hyperactive signaling through RAS, which is what NF1 regulates, as being uh, important in the genesis of JMML. That was uh, formally proven, <coughs> excuse me, when NRAS mutations were subsequently found in patients without neurofibromatosis who had JMML, 
really sort of uh, confirming in, uh, the RAS mutation, the mutations affecting the RAS pathway were going to be um, the principal cause of JMML. Um, so moving on then, there was, uh, so this is science basically in the area of genetics, and then there's a second way to look at this question, which is what is the cell biology of the disease? And we know that when patients come to us, they have certain characteristic features, such as large spleens, high white counts, monocytosis, and a paradoxical reduction in the production of red blood cells and platelets. So the cellular basis of this is also very interesting. And I think a major clue to that came from this uh, very important work from Peter Manuel showing that um, hypersensitivity to a specific cytokine, um, GMCSF, was characteristic of JMML. It was also known that um, the spontaneous colonies, that the, the, the bone marrow cells could grow without any extra stimulation in JMML and also in some leukemias. But there seemed to be a really unique association between this particular cytokine, GMCSF, and this particular disease. And um, although you can perform the assay in a way that the spontaneous colonies are suppressed, uh, there is always this hypersensitivity to growth factor here shown as robust growth with a very low dose of, of cytokine that's too low to support normal growth. This comes back now to the genetics because um, the uh, finding of NF1 as a tumor suppressor gene allowed mouse models to be made. And this is the first mouse model for JMML based on mice that are mutant for NF1. And they could be uh, crossed and bred to make NF1 null mice. These are not viable, but their fetal livers could be transplanted into recipients. And so the bone marrow lacking the NF1 gene could be generated, and that, in fact, recapitulated the clinical features of JMML in a mouse, and also uh, recapitulated the hypersensitivity to growth factors. Uh, this is an important advance because now there was actually a tractable laboratory tool, and I think it must have been a matter of months before mice with JMML outnumbered patients with JMML. Um, and in fact, it did so with much more genetic consistency and tractability, and they don't have to sign consent forms. So this uh, sets up a very uh, tractable system for advancing uh, basic science, and we'll hear much more about mouse modeling later in the day. And I think, in fact, it has been quite productive. 